I'm starting this thing up here now. We're going to uh, back to Wednesday night Bible study. So if you're new here, welcome. If you're not new here, hello again. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about some things today that hopefully will uh, clarify some common confusion aspects of the Bible. Uh, as we said before, it's a pretty big book. It's got a lot of books inside of the books. So in general, you got 66 of them. So you kind of kind of figure out which one do I read first, you know, uh, like anything, uh, if you read the end of a book, you wouldn't really understand who the characters are, right? And if you read the beginning of a book, you'll at least get the introduction of the characters. But if you read the cliff notes, right, what do you get? You get the, you know, abridged version of the entire book. So what we would call the epistles of Paul. Those are kind of like the, the cliff notes, but then they're expounded upon, meaning he gives you the cliff notes to the Old Testament, everything that you kind of need to know about in the Old Testament. He clarifies a lot of issues, and, and partially he does that for the Gentiles' sake. So when I say that Gentile, I use that word because if you were outside of the nation of Israel, you would be considered a Gentile. So that'd be the Romans, that'd be the Greeks, that'd be the barbarians, any of those, you would just be a Gentile. And so Paul is going to give them some instruction about some of these things that's, that's necessary for them to know about in the epistles, uh, sometimes in relation to Israel. So they say, well, remember about Moses. They don't necessarily know who Moses is. I mean, they may say, dude, I've never heard of Moses in my entire life. But if you ask an Israelite or if you ask a Hebrew who Moses is, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we know who Moses is. No problem. If you tell them who's Noah, who's Abraham, who's Isaac, who's Jacob, they'd be very well familiar with it, right? And that kind of makes sense because just like anything, it's, it's, uh, the, the Israel culture was, was there as well. So in a combination of both of those things, Paul, Paul wants to clarify for you uh, as a Gentile some issues. So if you're going to read a book in the Bible and say, well, where do I begin? You should begin in the book of, of Romans because in that book, it's a doctrinal book. So what doctrine means is simply teaching, and it's a teaching book. So when you have uh, the Word of God, Paul says in, in 2 Timothy 3, says all Scripture is given, that's the written word, by inspiration of God. That means that man penned it, but God actually wrote it in the sense of, of the, the, the words, the meaning, the rest of the things. And he says it's profitable for doctrine. So the doctrine would be the book of Romans. Another doctrinal book uh, would, would be like the book of Ephesians. That would be a doctrinal book. A doctrinal book for correction would be the book of Galatians. If you mess something up in Romans and you thought about something that you didn't really understand, you thought you were going to uh, perhaps attain eternal life or justification by works, Galatians would clarify that for you and say, no, that's not possible. You're only justified by faith and faith alone. And he would clarify those issues. And, and that's kind of how the same thing goes. Hebrews would be a doctrinal book for the Hebrews. It would be like the, the book of Romans to an Israelite. So an Israelite would read the book of Hebrews. And that's why today as a Gentile, if you read the book of Romans and you don't necessarily know a lot about the Old Testament and the covenants and the promises, you may be confused and say, ah, man, there's a lot of stuff in there. I don't really know what to talk about, you know. So in, in all of those things, I think one of the major problems that people have with the Bible is they say, all right, so I'm going to read the Bible, and who cares about the old? Let's talk about the new. So they go right into the new, and they go into the New Testament, right? And that's what they would say. Let's start in the New Testament. Well, who here thinks the New Testament starts in the book of Matthew? Anybody think the New Testament starts in the book of Matthew? No, you don't, Jamie. You're just being funny. That's, that's my wife. Anyways, uh, so yes, the New Testament does not start in the book of Matthew, contrary to what is written in your Bible. So we'll make this very clear that when you read your scriptures, the only thing that is inspired is God's word are the actual words themselves. Not the little numbers, not the little pieces that tell you anything. No, it's just the words themselves are the inspired word of God. So when we come back and you, and you start looking at, uh, okay, well, if, if you open your Bible like most have, if you turn right before the book of Matthew, it says the New Testament, doesn't it? Well, turn with me to the book of Hebrews for just a second and look at Hebrews chapter number 9. And we'll go there just for a second. And while you're turning, I'll open up in a word of prayer. Dear God, again, we come before you. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, to study. It's a privilege to do this. And it's, a, uh, uh, it's an exciting experience to always open your word to see what you have to say. And as we go through and study, uh, have the Spirit speak to us, uh, that we uh, understand what it is that you'd have us to learn about your word so we can discern the spiritual understanding and uh, grow in faith and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it's says his name we pray, amen. So Hebrews chapter number nine, like I said, Hebrews is a book for the Hebrews, but 
Also, as a Gentile, can you get understanding from the book of Hebrews? Of course. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So the issue of profitability varies based upon, number one, who you are, and number two, uh, what time period you're in, if you're, whether or not you're Israel with their covenants and promises, or the body of Christ, which we'll talk a little bit about today. So in Hebrews chapter number 9, look at verse number 16 for me. It says the following, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So in a, in a concept of wills, uh, trusts and estates, you go ahead and you fill out what? You, you go ahead and you make yourself a will. And what are you called when you make a will? Ian, who's, what's the person called that makes a will? The testator. the testator. And what does he make? He makes a last will and what? Testament. Okay, so there's what the understanding is of what the word actually means. Think about that. So he's making his last testament. He's telling about what he, what he wants to do with his, his property, how he wants it divested, how he wants it moved, how he wants it changed, all of those things, who he bequeaths things to. That would be the, the nice old English word there, a good KJV word. But, you know, that's, that's what it would be. But where there's a testament, there has, there's a testator who makes the promise, who creates the testament, but it's not effective as we've said many times, until the death of the testator. That's why it says here, uh, where there's a testament, a testament is, there must also, of necessity, it's, it's necessary that there be the death of the testator. So until the testator dies, the testament is of none effect. Look what it says in verse 17. For a testament is of force after men are dead. So before a man is dead, there is no effect in the tes testament. So I'm sure my dad has a last will and testament. And if I got his last will and testament and I looked at it and I said, okay, what am I getting? And I looked down over here and I go, oh, sweet. I'm getting my dad's house. I'm getting his condo. Nice. nice. I'll be able to go fishing a lot more. And I go, all right, I'm going to, I think I'm going to move in now. So I go over to my dad's house and I got my suitcase over there and I knock on the door and I go, hey, what's going on? He goes, I'm just hanging out. Okay, well, I'm going to come in here. Uh, which room is best? You know, what? I like the master bedroom. Can I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take that. My dad's like, what are you doing? Well, the last one in Testament says that I get your place. And my dad says, dude, I got to be dead before you can go in there. Make sense? Right. So all of this has to come back to the understanding of when does the Old Testament actually begin? And when does the old, when the New Testament, I'm sorry, when does the New Testament actually begin? And, and, and what does that mean? So look again at verse 17. It says, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all. So what does that mean? Not at all while the, while the testator liveth. Who made the New Testament? Who created the New Testament? Jesus Christ did. God did through his son Christ. So Jesus making the testament would make Jesus Christ the testator. And in the books of Matthew through John, ask yourself the simple question, when does Jesus die? At the end of each of those books. So what precedes that is not the New Testament. Does that make sense? It doesn't become effective until after the testator dies. And that's kind of part of the understanding why, why many get so confused when you look at this, this chart here, which kind of is a, is a 30,000 foot view of the scripture, as we've always said, kind of give you an understanding of what's going on. And, and most people, if you were going to go ahead and read through the scriptures, uh, skipping everything that the Apostle Paul talks about in the epistles, you would end up with a chart that looks something about like this. Okay, From the beginning with Adam, to Abraham, Moses, the kings of David, the judges afterwards... The, the period of, of four years of silence between Malachi and Matthew, and then another prophet named John the Baptist. So there's a lot of prophets in between all these things that you could, we could talk about and go through. But in, in, a, in a nutshell, the confusion doesn't really begin there. That's not really the confusing part. The confusing part is when you think that, okay, this is all about me. I sit down, I read the Bible, and it's all about me. Well, that's not necessarily true. All scripture is definitely for you. Yes, you can read the Bible to your heart's content. You can look at it and understand things. But there are certain things that you need to understand are not written about you. Or they're not written necessarily to you. So one of those, look at uh, the book of Romans, chapter number 15 for me. Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> So what do you do with the old? Do you throw it out? No, of course not. The old is still very beneficial, but it's, 
it's in a certain beneficial way that we have to look at it. We can't just go, okay, let's jump into the book of Genesis. I know so many people, I've talked to so many friends of mine and, 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 and just colleagues and people over the years who've said, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm going I'm to read through my Bible. I say, yeah, where are you beginning? Oh, I'm going to start in Genesis. Okay, Genesis isn't that boring. I mean, to be honest with you, Genesis is pretty good. Uh, there's some lineage stuff which can kind of get a little redundant, but for the sake of, of, uh, of skipping that, you probably could. Cause, I mean, you don't really need it too much, but it helps out with the authenticity of God's word. Next is the book of Exodus. Yeah, Exodus is actually pretty exciting too. You read through there, that's the giving of the law. Exodus meaning their, their flight or their exodus from where? From Egypt. That's the nation of Israel. And so through all these things, that's pretty interesting. Okay, now Leviticus. Whew. That's going to get pretty boring. I mean, you're going to read it, and you know what you're probably going to do? This is ridiculous. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever read in my entire life. <laughs> Whoever did this? And you know what you have to, have to ask yourself? Is it, is it even possible to even do this? No, it's not. Because the law wasn't made for something for you to continue to try to do. It was made to show you one thing and one thing only, sin. So that's what we looked at in Romans chapter number three. We'll go over that in just a minute again. But look at Romans 15. Here is what the purpose of the Old Testament is for. It's, it's learning. That's it. For whatsoever things are written aforetime. That's before what Paul's talking about here in Romans. Were written for our learning. Okay. What can we learn from Romans chapter 15? This verse says this. He says that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's what the Old Testament does. It shows you that God is faithful to do exactly what he says. Isn't it? He keeps his end of the bargain always. Now, whether or not the other side does, that relinquishes his, from him from his obligation. But for the most part, everything we look at in the scriptures, God, actually not for the most part, everything he does, he's true. And he also actually accomplishes what he says. His will is done. So we can see when he makes a promise to Abraham, we can see that promise being fulfilled. And we go, great, that's, that's helpful. When he says, look, I'm going to protect you from your enemies, Joshua, just go in there and take over Canaan. You know, Ooh, God, I, I don't really know. No, go do it. I'm going to take care of you. He does it. And we realize, wow, that's nice. That's a good thing. But if you were to go, okay, let me go and, uh, you know what? I really like my neighbor's house. And you know what? He's a really bad guy. I don't know what he does. Say he's a murderer. He's some ex-convict. And you just hate him. And you go, God, I want to go over there and I want to take his house. Just like the Old Testament, Joshua went into Canaan and took land, you know, from the evil people. Can you go do that? But the Bible says something all about that. Shouldn't we, shouldn't we obey the Bible? And that's the most dangerous thing you could do. Be biblical Use the word of God to, to basically say something that you want to say. I want to say this. I can make the Bible say whatever I want to make it say. The truth is, come back and read it in its context. Because context is king. So in Romans 15, he says again, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, they're written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We learn about how God dealt with man in times past and how he's always faithful, how he's always true to do exactly what he says. So that would be the issue here of what's called times past, okay? Time or times past would be right here. Those things that are written before time, it would be times past. So how far that extends, we'll talk about today. We'll tell you where time <coughs> past ends and where Paul says, but now. This would be the but now age. I'm going to keep this thing closed just so we can kind of keep seeing this as God's prophetic program completely laid out. In scripture, it's very clear. Nothing would be, you could find all of these verses, you can see them all, and they make abundantly clear sense as to how God's program was going to work through all of the ages. But there's a, there's a central grasp that we have to do before we even get to any of this. Before we can start here and go, okay, this chart looks really exciting. Let's really dig into it. And let's try to figure out what this is. Because maybe you've heard about the Bible. Or maybe you, I kind of read one or two things. I've been to church five or six times. Or maybe a hundred times. Or maybe a thousand times. Maybe you're like me. And you grew up in Christian school for 12 years. And uh, maybe you, uh, like my brother, he went to four years of Christian college after that. So he had 16 years of Christian education. That's a lot of education. But I'll tell you that in all that education I had, there were some people who told me a lot of lies, unfortunately. A lot of things that, you know, they weren't necessarily true. And I'll preface it by saying this. They were very sincere in what they believed. They were like, oh, this is this and this is that. And I said, okay. And I was looking at the Bible. But 
it didn't always make sense. I always felt like there's got to be more to it. There's got to be something that I can actually grasp with my hands on and, and read and then be able to have the understanding of, of what God wants me to do. I mean, because I read the law and I go, well, do I try to go back and do all those things? Because every time I try to do that, all I end up doing is going, well, I failed again. Oops. You know, I mean, how many people have a resolution? Okay, this this New Year's, I'm going to, you know, lose weight or whatever. Okay, what's another one? This year, I'm going to go to church more, right? January, churches are packed. January 2nd week, the attendance is empty. Because they go, ah, we remember why we didn't come here in the first place. And then the cycle repeats itself again and again. And part of the problem is what? Why do they go to church? Why do people go to church? Usually they go because they're like, well, maybe God wants me to go to church. I, I guess he wants me to go. And if I go to church... Then maybe he'll be happy with me. Well, what if I told you that had being, God being happy with you or, or having peace with God has nothing to do with whether or not you go to church or not? He doesn't care. And to be honest with you, as a pastor said a long time ago, uh, he was struggling finding a church in his area. He says, Pastor, I live in this really remote area. There's not many good churches. The couple I've been to don't preach doctrine, and it's just they're all over the place, and, and I really think that I don't know what I should do with my kids. And you know what he told him? He said, take your kids fishing and talk to them about the Bible. And that couldn't be truer. If there's a problem in the church, you're, you're not necessarily always going to be able to fix it. Because some of the churches, many of the churches, as we said before, are run not by God. They're run by the devil. They're run by Satan. And I know you say, well, come on now. Is that really true? Yes. It's abundantly true. Because Satan himself, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, he says, Satan himself, he says, no marvel. Don't even think this is something that Satan can't do. Don't think, oh, I thought he was a bad guy. No, he transforms himself into an angel of light. And his ministers, what does his ministers do after bad things? No, his ministers are the ministers of righteousness. So they look like they're doing good stuff. Oh, let's keep the Ten Commandments and try really hard to do it. And then maybe God will be happy with you. No, that's not the purpose of it. So before we can dig into this chart, before we can really understand it all, we have to go to the central issue of how God wants this to be accomplished. He says, I have a specific plan for you, for you to understand your Bible. I have a specific plan for you, for how you should actually read, understand, and study the scriptures. Romans chapter 16, please, and look at verse number 25. Paul, in the book of Romans, he's tried to close the book out now several times. If you notice, he keeps saying amen, and he says, okay, we're done, amen. Oh, and he's like, well, one more thing, I got to add this in here. And so again, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes down here in, in the very end, some very profound words. The profound words uh, really for me were, were some of the most helpful in my understanding of the scriptures. When I read this, I said, wow, that, that really makes a whole lot of sense because there's an order to it. It's not just put there for just, okay, we can do it however we want to do it. No, number one, look what he says. He says, now to him, that's talking about God, that is of power to establish you according to, and he gives you the list. Here's the list of what he gives. He says, number one, he's establishing you according to my gospel. And so the gospel in its purest form was given to the Apostle Paul, and it's called the gospel of the grace of God. Now there's a whole other gospel called the gospel of the kingdom, which is preached all throughout the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's the, gospel, the everlasting gospel, which is preached in Revelation. There's the gospel in Galatians that's preached to Abraham. So what does that mean? Which gospel do I believe? Is it really that many gospels? Well, all the gospels, you must understand, revolve around God. Every single one revolves around God. And it revolves around the issue of you trusting the gospel or you believing the gospel. Or in other words, having faith. That's it. That's what the gospel is all about. The gospel, the good news of the kingdom, which many take and say, well, see, doesn't, doesn't Christ say to do this? And doesn't he say that your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of this? And don't I have to do all those things? Well, you have to have an understanding of who he's talking to and what he's getting into. And Todd and I talked about this a little last night. Actually, we spent about two hours in, I think, 15 minutes on Skype talking about some of these subjects. And uh, I'm not rehashing or anything. I'm just kind of saying that these are really important as a baseline understanding. And when you go to church, you only get, what, 30 minutes of preaching maybe, right? Maybe, maybe 20 minutes. If you're, if, you, if, you're at a, if you're at a good church, people would say, that's a good church. Oh, you only got 20 minutes. Oh, this guy's going long. Come on, I'm hungry. Got the game on. Get out of here. I want to leave, right? Isn't that what most people do? They show up to church. I mean, you should want to go to church because church, as Paul says, should be the pillar, right? 
and ground of the truth. I mean, you should go to church because there's truth there. I mean, it's the pillar. It's, it's rock solid because it's based upon Jesus Christ and it's based upon him and him alone. But unfortunately, it's not. It's based upon you. It's based upon a performance system. You trying to please God in some cockamamie idea that you've, dis- that you've either made or that the pastor's told you to do. And for lack of a better term, you're ignorant because you won't read the Bible. Oh, yeah, I was in that position. I was definitely ignorant. I could tell you by the time I looked it up last night, by the time I was in sixth grade, I had known 600 Bible verses. Sixth grade, I knew 600 Bible verses. By the time I was in 8th grade, I knew 800 Bible verses. I could recite to you 800 Bible verses. Think about that just for a second. That's a lot. But you know what? I had it kind of all over the place. Some of it was over here, and I didn't really know what it meant. I just recited it back. I'd be like, okay, this verse sounds good. Jesus wept, John 11, 35. Okay, that one sounds good. You know, I don't really know what that means. What was he weeping about, you know? Uh, I don't even know. I just memorized it. And that was part of the issue. I didn't do this, you know, in terms of, like just going one day and reading my Bible, I did it because there's a program called Awana, which is uh, approved workmen are not ashamed based upon 2 Timothy 2.15. It's kind of like a Christian Boy Scouts. It's good. It's Christian Boy Scouts. I don't have a problem with the program. It's very good. And I would encourage, I would, hopefully, if, my, if, there's, if Awana is still around when little Noah is old enough to go into it, we'd, we'd love to have him go to it. So, but look at this, what he says here again. He says, now to him that is of power, that's God, to establish you according to my gospel. And then let's take it and let's read it again and take out the my gospel and go to the next part. He says, now to the hymn is a power to establish you according to the preaching of Jesus Christ. Hold on. Look at the next statement. According to the revelation of the mystery. Well, maybe you read that and you're like, I don't know. I know for certain that I read that at some point in time in my life from the time of probably fourth grade to my senior year of high school, maybe my first couple years of college, I definitely read the book of Romans, but I never understood what that meant. I'd read stuff all the time and be like, I don't know. So what do you kind of do? You're lazy. I don't want to figure that out. That takes too much time. Just give it to me. Give it to me in the condensed version. So what do you do? You go open a commentary and you start reading that and you're like, oh, this is easier. This guy just tells me what's going on. But what's the problem in that? You're interjecting a man into the reading of God's word. And that's a problem. Now you may say, well, Jason, hold on a second. Aren't you up here right now commentating on the scriptures? Yes. But I'm giving you the scripture and I want you to read it for yourself and some take notes and write down and say, yeah, you can look at these verses later because as we know, search the scriptures and see, not take it from me. So we'll talk about Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And look what he says about the mystery. He says, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. That's that age again. If you're looking at the chart, you have the time past. The issue of the but now. Okay. So kind of keep that in your mind when we're thinking here in just a second. Excuse me. When we go over a couple of these verses. So time past, but now, ages to come. Somebody asked me one time, like, what's on, what? I mean, I can't figure out what's on the other side of the chart. Well, just so you know, this side of the chart here and this side of the chart here are the exact same. So when we close it, we're just showing God's prophetic program. When we open it up, we're showing the dispensation of grace of God in addition to the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery as a parenthesis or as the break between God's prophetic program, what he was doing in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the early stages of the book of Acts before the raising up of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter number 9. So again, let's read this uh, with the last portion, okay? Now to him that is a power to establish you according to the scriptures of the prophets. Okay, so are the scriptures of the prophets profitable? Of course. But where are they at in this list? Where are they at? They're at the bottom. Because that information, prophetically, doesn't apply to you. The prophecy aspect is good for you because those things are written aforetime. That's everything that's happened in the Old Testament is written for your learning that you through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Sure, we get hope from reading the Old Testament, don't you? I do. I love reading stuff in the Psalms. I love seeing uh, David just talk about how how he was in such despair, but then God forgave him. It's just it's just a great there's there's so many other pieces of scripture I can talk about uh, um, Noah and and even Jonah. I love that 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 piece as well. Jeremiah is a great book. If you've never read it, it's really good, but 
if you've never read the book of Romans, let's start there first. Let's not get you into, Re you know, Jeremiah, Revelation, Hebrews. You're going to get confused. You're going to be like, whoa, hold on. What's going on? So we want to make sure that we we're clear in what we say. So this issue of the gospel, why is it so important that you understand this? Well, without the gospel, I'm going to make it very clear that you can't understand the Bible. You can read it on a superficial level. You can read it to read the words, but to actually get the understanding out of it, you can't do it. When Todd and I were talking last night, he goes, how did you learn this? And I was showing him some things in the scripture. And I said, nobody taught me. I learned it by the Holy Spirit reading his word. That's how I learned it. I didn't like, I, I tell you, I don't read commentaries. I don't even think I, I mean, I may have one over there that I got for a Christmas present. I just don't read them because I don't really care. I mean, I really don't care what somebody else has to say. I believe that God's word's here. It's perfect. It's fallible. It's ready for me to read. Let me read it. And we can understand it by the power of the Holy Spirit as God says. And where does he say that? He says it in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Go ahead and turn there just for a second. So here's what ends up happening. You have to have the Spirit of God. People are like, oh, okay, I got the Spirit. I saw that one time. I got slain in the Spirit. Well, you won't find that phrase anywhere in the Bible, slain in the Spirit. I had some people roll around on the ground and move their arms and speak in tongues and everything else that they try to go do. Well, I'll tell you that God's not doing any of that today, not one single bit, not in any way, shape, or form. Everything that they do is unbiblical. Let's clarify that. It's biblical. It's found in the Bible. But it's unbiblical because what you're doing is you're taking doctrine and teaching for somebody else and trying to apply it to yourself. Same thing goes with prophecy. Same thing goes with the gifts of healing. Same thing goes with any other miracles and signs and wonders. Those are for the nation of Israel because we don't really care. As Gentiles, signs and miracles and wonders aren't really what we're looking for. What we're really looking for is wisdom. If you look at, at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 22, look what it says here. He says, uh, for the Jews require a sign. So that's why these signs were done. The miracles, the wonders, the, the gifts, the tongues, all of those things were for the Jews. So the Jews go, wow, we need it. We see the sign. I mean, how many times do they say, uh, the Pharisees say, hey, Jesus, um, show us a sign. And Jesus is like, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. He goes, you guys are horrible. It's all you want to do. You just want to keep seeing signs and signs and signs. And from Christ's inception, his very first day, his appearing out with John the Baptist in the wilderness, we see a sign. What's his sign? The glory of God shines upon him in his, in his, in his beautification there and glorification in Matthew 3. But the Jews require a sign. And what do the Greeks seek after? We would be Greeks, just so you know. That's who we would be. We'd be Gentiles, Greeks, Romans, Europeans, those type of things. That's who we would be. What do, we, what do we seek after? We seek after wisdom. We want real knowledge. We want to really know what's going on. And that's why for us in, in, a, in, in this area, we care more about science, right? And then what everybody cares about? Science, science, science. And science is just knowledge. It's just increased knowledge. Really good knowledge will be called wisdom. That'd be like, wow, that's really good. So science, as Paul says, you know what he calls science? He says science so falsely called because it's not really knowledge. But let's look over at second at First Corinthians chapter number uh, two, and look what he says here. And let's start in verse number. Let's look in verse number nine. Okay, verse number nine is a verse that I think many have heard over the years, and uh, I'd actually have misquoted it on several occasions improperly. Let me give you the the context here. He says this. He says, "But as it is written." I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Right? So let me, let me just clarify what he's talking about here. Anytime you see the word as it is written, what's he doing? He's quoting back to the Old Testament. He's saying, here, I'm going to tell you this, but look what he does. He puts a but in verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. But God hath revealed them. So what God has prepared for us as members of the body of Christ, as saved individuals, absolutely. No question asked. We know what's going to happen. This isn't like a mystery. We're not like, man, I, I kind of wonder what God's going to do when he comes back. I wonder where we're going to go when we die. I mean, there's no question. Not all those answers are very clear in Scripture. And we also understand what our position is, what we're going to be doing in heaven, why we're supposed to be doing it, and what the purpose of everything is. But look what he says. But God hath revealed them unto us. He's speaking to saved individuals. And we use that word saved it simply means that you've placed your faith and trust in what Christ has done for you on the cross. Christ died for your sins. That's the gospel in a nutshell. He was buried and he rose again. That's it. That's the gospel. You believe that. You trust in that exclusively, solely, 100%. You have eternal life. Really? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Scripture makes that very clear. Look at verse number 10 again. 
He says, but God hath revealed them unto us. How does he do it? By his spirit. He says, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So is there some superficial understanding of God you can have? Yep. And then is there some really deep understanding? I, sometimes I start reading stuff and I'm like, I'm going through this. And I'm like, man, this passage is, there's got to be more. There's more to this. I'm, I'm seeing a correlation between what stayed here and in this other book. And all of a sudden you just get an understanding of, wow, I really get where this is matching up. And I see what he's saying on a, on a, on a deeper level, right? So if you read books, people do that all the time and they, they make conjectures. I mean, how many people say, oh, I've read Harry Potter like 15 times and the more I read Harry Potter, I find out more nuances to the story and we try to figure out what it is. Yeah, that's just man and his, and his wisdom and his knowledge. But what we do is, is by the power of the spirit to go through things. Look at verse number 11. He says, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. So everybody has a spirit of man who understands the things that are, that are around here that are relating to men. He says, even so the things of God knoweth no man. Here we go. You can't know anything about God without the spirit inside of you. Look what he says. But the spirit of God. Well, I want this spirit. I'd like to have it. How do I get it? Well, let me tell you this. In the scriptures, you know how many different ways you can get the spirit? A lot. A lot of different ways. Just read the entry of the book of Acts. At one point in time, it falls on people. At one point in time, they get baptized and they get it. Another point in time, they lay hands on them. So you're like, well, how do I do it? You know what they do? You go to church and they lay hands on you, baptize you, sprinkle you, and they try to make a little show. And like, hopefully at this point in time, you got the spirit. But see, the thing is, it's not an act. It's not some little thing we do. We do a little, you know, dog and pony show and bam, we got the spirit now. I mean, people do it all the time. They go to these churches. Go watch any of the modern day, what we would call Pentecostal movement. And they would do all these crazy things and you would be like, what the heck are they doing? And rightfully so. And you know why? Paul talks about that. He goes, look, you're doing these. People are going to come into church and say, these people are mad. They're mad. They're lunatics. I and mean, don't we say that today? I mean, you, you've never seen Benny Hinn smack people on the head and they fall backwards. Ah. There's a lady in our church by the name of Simone. She has... Uh, uh, I think she's got multiple sclerosis or one of those really bad degenerative like rheumatoid arthritis mixed with that. So she's, she has a hard time walking. She barely makes it into church, okay? And this lady came up from this type of upbringing, Church of God, Assemblies of God, Pentecostal, and she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed again. And she also went to all these healing sessions. And she remembered when she told me, she says, yeah, I went to one of these healing sessions one time and, and the pastor comes up and they, he, he hits me, but I didn't fall down. And I was just like, uh, I'm waiting for it. I'm still waiting for it. It's all just an act. They're just making a charade. If they could really heal people, they do the healing just like Jesus Christ did, just like the apostles did. They laid them in the streets in Acts chapter number four, and they healed every single one of them. Nobody's like, oh, I'm, oh, oh, no, my leg still hurts. Get it again. Get it again. Oh, bam, bam, bam. You've seen that guy? I don't know if you've seen that. He actually does the bam, bam, bam thing. No? Just Google bam, 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 Pentecostal. You'll see the guy hitting. He goes, bam, 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 bam. So you got to do it once or twice. And nobody did that. You didn't find that in the scriptures. You just made that up. And he tells you, people say, why did you do the bam thing? Oh, the bam thing came from God. God told me to do the bam thing. Whatever. It's stupid. You know, it's just nonsense. And the sooner you realize that, that you can be forthright and say, that's stupid. The sooner you're going to be able to go, okay, now what's not stupid? The word of God's not stupid, but people handle it stupidly by doing what? Taking things out of context. So look again what he says here. He says, For what man knoweth things of a man, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So how do you get the spirit? I, I want it. I want to get it. I'm going to tell you that it's, it's, you could get it right now, sitting right here, if you don't have the spirit already. Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 13, this isn't some magical uh, event that happens. You're not going to feel anything. You're not going to have tongues uh, of cloven fire come on top. None of that stuff's going to happen to you today. Uh, we have rec record of the scriptures of things like that happening, but they don't happen today. Look what Paul says in Ephesians chapter number 1, please, verse number 13. And this is really easy to understand. I, I, I don't see any problem in understanding how you get the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13 he says the following, in whom, well, look at verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Who trusted in Christ? Well, if it's the praise of his glory, the only person that should, we should glory in, as Paul says, 
Let him that glorieth glory in the Lord, the glory in God. And so when he says here, in whom he also trusted, who did you trust in? You trusted in Christ. At what point in time did you trust in Christ? Well, number one, he says, after that you heard the word of truth. So you had to hear some type of truth, as Paul says in Romans chapter number 14, uh, I'm sorry, verse number 10, chapter, chapter 10, verse 14, he says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He says, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news, great, of what? Of your salvation. Salvation from what? Of the wrath to come? Of judgment? Of every single one of your sins you've ever committed, past, present, and future? Wow, that's pretty good. That's amazing. So look what he says here. Keep going. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So let me ask you, do we see anything in here about you doing anything? What do you got to do? What does it say here to get the Spirit before you can start understanding the things of God? Believe, trust, you trusted, you heard the word of truth, it's the good news of your salvation, you have heard about it and you were so excited, you believed it, you said, this is great, best news I've ever heard, and what do you do? You're sealed. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Well, am I, am I sealed forever? Yes, 100%. He says, which is the earnest. When you go buy a house, we've talked about this before, you put down earnest money, right? What does that mean? That's mine. I've secured that. No other buyer can come in and get it. Nobody else can take it from me. He says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. What do you think that that Jesus Christ or God, what, what, how, do they, how do they purchase you? What way, shape, or form are you a purchased possession now? Well, look at the book of Acts. Hold your place in Ephesians 1. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 20 for me. Acts, chapter number 20. This is what he purchased. Paul talking to, this is, and here he's talking to the Ephesian elders. These guys are men who, who are strong in the faith. They know quite a bit about God's word, about uh, his plan for the ages, because Paul has explained it to them. Because why? Because they received the word and, and they were uh, uh, um, believers. And he says here, I kept back nothing that was profitable to you, declared unto you the whole counsel of God. And look what he says here in verse number uh, 27. He says, for I have not shunned. I didn't hold back, Acts 20, 27, for I have not shunned, I didn't hold back, I didn't only give you part of it, he says, I, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And the counsel of God is what was given to the Apostle Paul by revelation in Galatians chapter number 1, you can read a little bit about that. Uh, Acts chapter number 9 would be another place to kind of see uh, some things that are happening. But he gets revelation from God pertaining to things outside of the Old Testament, which is really where we find all of our doctrine today. When somebody wants to go to battle with the Word of God, you know what the book is that should be most used? should be the book of Romans, because that's the strength of everything. That's where it comes together as a culmination of just the whole thing, righteousness, temperance, salvation, and judgment to come, no questions asked. He says here, he gives you all of it. Look at verse 28. He says, take heed. Therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So these people are leaders of a church. And what should they do? They should understand that and they should do what? Take heed. Just like Paul's declared the council of the Ephesians, the Ephesians should declare that council to them as well without mixing anything else. Don't, don't corrupt it. Don't change it. He says it just this way. He says he made you overseers to feed the church of God. And when you feed them, what do you give them? You feed them what? Feed them the word. Jeremiah says, your words were like honey and I didn't eat them. I ate them. I liked them. They were good. They tasted yummy. Why? Well, at some point in time, you're, you're going to get to that position. I'm at that position now where I like reading the word. I like studying it. I like growing in it. I read it and I go, this is great. Some nights I'm really tired. And I'm like, oh man, it'd be just nice just to sit here and surf the internet. But you know what I do? I go, no, I need to read. I need to study. And I start studying. And you know what? I'm happy I did that. I'm happy I spent a couple minutes. First five minutes, you're trying to, you're reading through some stuff. And then as you go, you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. 
And you may not understand everything that you're reading. That's totally fine. You just circle little things as you go. Get a pencil. You can mark it up. You can get a new Bible if you need one. Just keep marking it up. Go through things. Start reading it and getting some understanding. And you start in the book of Romans because that's where our doctrine is for today. And that's why we do that is because he says in Romans chapter number 1, we said that in Romans 16, Paul said that it was first that you establishes you by my gospel. And that's the best place to go in Romans 1 because he says this. He says, um, I am debtor, both to who? Both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He says, so as much as in me is, meaning I'm not going to hold anything back, for as much as in me is, right, he's going to preach it. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. Yes? I don't want to get you on the no. trail, but the verse that you read, was that to the Gentiles and to the Israelites? Because it says to the people and to the flock? Yes. So Acts people. chapter 20, this is, yes. Acts chapter 20, this would be so, a, there is no, it doesn't matter at this point in time. No, this is okay. no distinction now. The church of God, this is the church of the body of Christ. There is no distinction at this point in time between the nation of Israel and the Jews. As Paul says, he says, in Christ Jesus, there's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. It doesn't matter anymore. You're all one in Christ Jesus. So obviously, you're not, you don't walk out here and be like, okay, I um, guess I'm not a male anymore. No, you're still a male in the flesh. But in Christ, it doesn't make any distinction here. So look what he says here to feed the church of God and feeding him. We're going to look at that in just a second. You feed him with the word. He says, which he hath purchased with his own blood. See, he did it for you. He died on the cross for you. He says, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. He says, for scarcely would, uh, would a man die for a, for, a, for a good man. And peradventure one might die, maybe perhaps for a, for a really righteous man. He says, but... God did something totally different. He didn't die for a good man. He didn't die for a righteous man. He says, but God commended his love or demonstrated his love toward us when? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. I mean, think about that just for a second. That's the best news you could ever hear. I know people will say, oh, I'm not really that bad. It doesn't matter. You have sinned. You've transgressed the law. You know it. Everybody does. Just be real with yourself and be like, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've messed up once, twice, three times times a million, probably, yes, a lot. But is there any hope for me? Yeah. And you know why there's hope? Because the Apostle Paul is that, I've always said the words, he's the quintessential picture of mercy and grace bestowed. Take your enemy and save him. Say, no, you have eternal life. Why? He says, because I believed on him for life everlasting. Wow. Paul messed up more than anybody. Trust me, this guy was bad news. You did not want to be around him. He was a dirty, rotten scoundrel. He was... He was charged with leading a pretty uh, religious or a bunch of zealots, but they had no understanding about what they were doing. He was a Jew. He just said, I just go out here and I, I kill the Christians. I kill any believer. Just kill them. Haul them off to prison. I laid waste, as he says. He laid waste to them. That doesn't mean that he just was like, stop saying that. No, he laid waste. He killed them. He got rid of them. He wanted to stamp this whole thing out because he was concerned about losing his position of power. You can look in John chapter number 11 with the issue of Caiaphas there, but they're concerned about losing their position of power and leadership and authority. And if the Christians are correct and they're saying that Jesus is going to come back to rule on the earth, well, we got a huge problem. I was sitting here uh, the other day, actually it was this morning, I was sitting there and, and as my habit and custom is, I occasionally check Facebook. Don't lie, you guys all do the same thing. I was checking out Facebook and I'm surfing and I got a lot of friends on there. I got tons of people that I've met over the years and pastors and different people. And so a pastor makes a post <clears throat> regarding um, a guy named John MacArthur. Anybody ever heard of John MacArthur? Yeah, John. He's got a program called Grace to You on WKS. Um, if you want to know my thoughts on John MacArthur, you can ask me afterwards. But um, anyways, we'll keep going. He says, uh, he says this, John MacArthur makes a couple statements and he's actually going against uh, the Democratic Party. He's like, oh, I'm really anti the Democratic Party because they all blaspheme God. And he says they blaspheme God because they uh, agree with abortion, they agree with homosexual marriage, they agree with uh, handing out free condoms, condoms so people can go fornicate. They, you know, he goes through this whole big thing, and I'm like, okay, Romans 1, most of this stuff is pretty accurate, but what's the, what's the opposite of that? And so he kind of makes a pull without saying anything about politics, like which side he endorses. Well, Come on, what's he trying to do here? He's got a political slant on this, and he says, you know, but, you know, he doesn't really ever say that we're Republicans, but of course, he's, he's demonstrating that the Republicans are moral and they don't blaspheme God. Well, let me tell you this abundantly clear. Um, Mitt Romney is a Mormon. 
Yes, a Mormon. If you know anything about Mormonism, it's uh, the second largest cult. The first would be Catholicism. I don't know. That might hurt you if you're a Catholic or used to be a Catholic. You may say, oh, hold on, I disagree. We can sit here for till 12 o'clock, ask Todd. We've done it, and we can talk about things. And I know that may hurt, but let me just explain why. And the second is, is Mormonism, because it, it, it is against the word of God. To blaspheme means you speak contrary to God's word. Contrary to God's word is what the Mormons do. Jesus is not the brother of Satan. You don't go up to heaven. The wife isn't saved by the man, and then they go up to heaven. They have this whole idea of what they want to, want to project and move out. But at the end of the day, they're preaching unto you, as Paul says, another Jesus. They use the word Jesus, all right. Yep. It's not the Jesus of the Bible, that's for sure. So, same thing with the Catholics. Who's a Catholic? Paul Ryan's a Catholic. Is he not? Is not Paul Ryan a Catholic? He is. Um... What's he believe? Well, you can go online and look at about little things about what he believes. Um, it's pretty interesting. But again, Catholicism, in a nutshell, is contrary to God's word because they frustrate, not even frustrate, they deny the grace of God. They say that there is no grace of God, or you can fall out of God's grace. As long as you're working real hard, then you'll get grace. Hmm. Look with me over at the book of Romans just for a second. This is the frustration that I want to show you. Romans, chapter number. Let me get it for you here. Romans, chapter number 11, please. And this is the comparison between works and grace, okay? So the statement that a Catholic would say, would say, while we work. And as long as we work, we're within God's good graces. Haven't you ever heard that before? Oh, I hope I'm in God's good graces. What does that mean? No, God has demonstrated grace. He says in Titus chapter number two, he says the grace of God hath appeared to all men. You know how it appears to all men? It's because God's not coming in and killing nations like he used to do. That's the grace of God. He's not imputing the trespasses unto them. He's like, look, right now, it's an abatement. I'm taking a step back. You just wait. You can treasure up wrath unto the day of wrath all you want into the righteous revelation of the judgment of God. But let's sit here and look at this in Romans chapter number 11. So as I said, a Catholic believes, yes. I mean, you can read. I, I, can, I have the, the, the Catholic uh, uh, Diocese of St. Pete. I've been looking at some of their stuff recently. And uh, they say this in the following in, in verse 6. And if by grace, right, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. So to get grace, you don't work for it. You just get it. If you work, there's no grace there. You worked for it. So they're mutually exclusive, and you can't do grace and works. They don't work. They don't mend. They don't blend. They, don't, they, they can't function together. They're so contrary to each other. Read the book of Galatians, and Paul talks about that in the very beginning. He says, I can't believe that some of you guys are already, you know, you, you've, 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 you've left the faith. You've abandoned this because why? Because you heard somebody else preach some message that you thought, well, that sounds a little bit better. Maybe I should just try a little bit. And they mix the law and the grace and Paul says, if they preach any other gospel unto you, unto that which we have preached unto you, he says, I don't care if it's me, if it's another person, if it's, a, if it's an angel from heaven, I don't care who preaches it to you, let them be accursed. And he says it twice in Galatians chapter number 1. Because the issue, folks, look at Romans 11, verse, or 10 verse 17. He says, so then faith, it comes by hearing. What you do right here in Bible studies, you hear, it grows your faith. And he says, in hearing by the word of God. What are we preaching? What is the central goal? Is it to hear Jason talk for an hour? No, no. You should come to look at the words, look at the pages on the book and go, okay, this is good. Okay, I've, I've, I've marked that one down. I'll come back and take a look at it. I'll make sure it's really clear. See, Romans chapter four is a place that the Catholic doesn't like to go. Because what it does is it rids everything and anything of the need to work for anything. Romans chapter number four, verse number uh, one. Let's just read these few things and we'll close in about three minutes. 
Paul says this in Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say then, Abraham our father, as pertaining the flesh hath found? So this is Abraham. This is before the the Lord Jesus Christ had died on the cross. He says, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So the people are saying, well, look, Abraham, he did good works, didn't he? Of course Abraham did a lot of good works. Yeah, nobody's going to deny that. Did he do a lot of bad things? Yep, he did a lot of stupid things. He did a lot of sin as well. He didn't believe God many times. But look what he says here. He says, well, what's the question? They're asking for if Abraham, uh, he says, what, what is Abraham? What did he find? Did he get justified? Does he have righteousness? That's the question in verse 1. <laughs> Paul makes the little clarification in verse 2. And then he just says in verse 3, he goes, look, do I even have to answer this question? No. Just go back and read the Old Testament. He says, what saith the scripture? He says, Abraham believed God. He did. He did that in Genesis 15, verse 6. And what happens? He says, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He got righteousness by believing God? Yeah. Look what he says in verse 4. Remember when I told you that those things that are written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope? Remember when I said that in, in, in Romans chapter number 15, that we read the scriptures and we have hope? Well, here's what it is. The hope hasn't changed. The hope is always God. Now the message is Jesus Christ, him crucified. That's what we preach, his death, burial, and resurrection. Look at verse number five, or verse four, I'm sorry. Romans 4, 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So just like we said before in Romans chapter uh, 11, if it's of grace, then it's no more of works. If it's of works, it's no more of grace. So now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And if you haven't memorized verse 5, I highly suggest you do it. Because in memorization of God's word, it's the quickest way that you can keep your mind from the devil. Satan will all the time try to tell you, well, no, dude, you've got to work hard. You're such a horrible sinner. You do stupid things all the time. And you're like, oh, man, maybe I'm really bad. You don't keep the law. You, know and you, just, you get these things in your mind because that's where Satan works. He calls it, Paul calls it the helmet of salvation. Because it's the guard of your mind. That's what the word of God is. The word is the helmet of salvation. He says in verse number five, he says, But to him that worketh not. That doesn't mean try a little bit. That doesn't mean, well, maybe I'll help out and put one toe. No. Worketh not, but believeth. So I want to make sure this is abundantly clear that if you're working, you're not believing. If you're believing, this is logic here. I mean, I know it might be hard to grasp sometimes. It's late and I've been going for already an hour. But if it's believing, what? It's not work. Make sense? But to him that worketh not, but believeth. Working is not believing. And believing is not working. You believe on him that justifies who? Who does he justify? You ever heard the phrase, turn from your sin and God will heal you? Turn from your wicked ways, turn from your sin, repent, as they use the word, repent from your sin, and then, then you can get saved. Then you give God will maybe give you eternal life. Well, can I tell you today that there's nobody ever who has repented of their sin? Uh, the book of John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Whoa. So you say, oh, I've now repented, I'm great, I've, I've cleaned up my life. Um, read the book of 1 Corinthians, please, and you'll see that these people were saved, but they had no doctrine. They had no teaching. They lived a very lascivious lifestyle. We talked about that last week. They were sleeping with their, their mothers and mother-in-laws and all kinds of crazy things. And he says here in verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justify the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what is belief? It's faith. What is faith? It's belief. Is faith works? No. Because it can't be. But to him that worketh not. So in all of this, let's close with the last piece here in verse number, uh, look at verse number 20, 20. Look at verse number 20, okay? Uh, 4 verse 20. This is talking about Abraham. We can go through all of this. I'd love to go through it. But again, for time's sake, we don't always have enough time. But 4 verse 20, this is talking about Abraham. He says, and he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Now, if you remember just a little bit about Abraham, he did stumble at the promise of God through unbelief at some point in time in his life. At the beginning, he believed God and God counted him for righteousness. After that point in time, God's like, you don't have any more sin. I forgave it all. It's all taken care of. As we read in, with David here in 4 verse 6, he says, 
There's he, God's, God, your sins are forgiven and your sins are covered. They're taken completely care of. So look what he says here again in verse number 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. None of this has to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord.